And without further ado, here's Matthias Guritz, Professor of Practice of Comparative Literature, and your host for this evening. Good evening. Welcome and welcome back for this second event in the International Writers Series, a new collaboration between the International Writers Track of the Program in Comparative Literature and the University Libraries to celebrate new publications of creative works by writers and translators and the Washington University in St. Louis community. Our guests tonight are plentiful, as plentiful and unique as the book we are going to talk about today, Vicento Udobro's Skyquake, Tremor of Heaven, published recently in a trilingual edition with the original Spanish and French by the independent publisher Co. Im Press. Inspired by the legend of Tristan and Isolde, Vicente Udobro's Skyquake, as a stunning long poem driven, driven by a relentless seismic energy that takes metaphor making and image building to unprecedented heights. Originally published in Madrid in 1931 under the title Temblor de Cielo and in Paris in 1932 as Tremblement de Ciel, this bilingual text stands out as a milestone of the 20th century avant-garde. But what hell on earth is a skyquake? Do the heavens shake when poets speak? Is the apocalypse upon us? Is the author playing mind games to shock us? Or might we understand a skyquake as a metaphor for rapturous love or even as an attempt to create a new poetic language? Meaning is plentiful and our plentiful guests will shed lights on these questions. Let me first briefly introduce the two translators of Uidobro's poem who have so graciously accepted our invitation. Ignacio Infante is the author of After Translation, The Transfer and Circulation of Modern Poetics Across the Atlantic, 2013, a book that examines from a transnational and interlingual approach the role of translation in the transatlantic flow of modern poetry and poetics. Ignacio Infante's second scholarly monograph, A Planetary Avant-Garde, Experimental Poetics, Transnational Literary Literature Networks and the Legacy of Iberian Colonialism, is about to come out with the University of Toronto Press. In addition to these extended studies of transfer and translation, he has published many book chapters and articles on translation and translation theory. A literary translator himself, Professor Infante, has also translated into Spanish John Ashbery's poetry collection A Wave as Una Ola with Penguin Random House in 2003 and Will Self's novel How the Dead Live as Como Viven los Muertos in 2002. His most recent project with Michael Leon is this evening's subject. Michael Leon's poetry career began in the sixth grade when he won his first poetry prize in Mr. Harrison's class for a haiku about a snake. This gorgeous detail, detail I got from his wonderful uh, blog on poetry. In the meantime, he has received degrees in English and creative writing from Dartmouth College, Sarah Lawrence College and Rutgers University, and was awarded a fellowship from the National Endowments for the Arts. His poems have appeared in journals such as Hotel America, Interim, Jubilat, Lana Turner, and new American writing, and were anthologized widely in the now and the the now and awards to the best innovative writing in 2013 and best American experimental writing in 2018. He is the author of four volumes of poetry: ESP 2009, Cutting Time with a Knife 2012, Who Unfolded My Origami Brain 2017, and Words on Edge. 2018, as well as a translation of the Chilean poet Estela Lamat, I, the worst of all, 2009. His monograph, Contested, Re Contested Records, the turn to documents in contemporary North American poetry, was published by the University of Iowa Press in spring 2020. He teaches at the California Institute of the Arts. Baba Baji is voicing the French of Uidobro's Tremblement de Ciel, Baba is a Senegalese American poet and PhD candidate in the International Writers Track of Comparative Literature. Baba's own first collection of poems, Ghost Letters, will come out very soon. 
Congratulations, Baba. And we will invite him back to talk about his work and, of course, present his ghost letters in February 2021. He is currently a PhD student in comparative literature at Washington University. Our three guests will be joined by Derek Madern, who will be our moderator tonight. Derek holds MFAs from University of Wisconsin-Madison in poetry and from the Iowa Translation Workshop, where he was an Iowa Arts Fellow. His translations of poems by Turkish poets Haider Ergülen, Şükrü Erbaş, and Cenk Gündudu have appeared or are forthcoming in Gulf Coast, The Common, Copper Nickel, Modern Poetry in Translation, World Literature Today, and Berlin Quarterly. His translation work has been supported by the British Centre for Literary Translation, the National Endowments for the Arts, and the Banff International Literature Translation Centre. Poems of his own have appeared in numerous magazines, and his work has been listed as a semi-finalist for the Dorset Prize and the Discovery Prize. He too is currently a PhD student in comparative literature at Washington University in St. Louis. I would like to thank Washington University's library for making these events possible, as well as the Committee on Comparative Literature and all other departments of arts and sciences, and numerous individuals who are involved with the program in comparative literature. Finally, I would like to take a moment to welcome and to express my special thanks and my deepest gratitude to our subject librarian, Walter Slecht, who is my partner in crime in setting up the International Writers Series. He is currently, as you know, overseeing all the technical stuff of this webinar format. But since there are verses about star-crossed lovers to delve into, a legendary tremor of heaven to indulge in, and three languages to deal with. Let's simply give all of our guests a big round of virtual applause. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ignacio Infante, Michael Leong, Baba Baji, and Eric Madron. Enjoy the conversation and the readings from Vicente Uidobro's daring long poem, Skyquake, during the next 60 minutes. Thank you so much, Matias, for that uh, terrific introduction. And it's, um, it, it's so great to be connected virtually to, to the WashU community. Um, and, and thank you all for, for tuning in. Um, so we're going to begin with a um, sampling from the beginning uh, of, of this long poem. And we'll um, progressively sample from the middle and then uh, the end. How many things have died inside us? How many dead do we carry within us? Why do we cling to our dead? Why do we insist on bringing them back? They prevent us from seeing the birth of an idea. We are afraid of the new light emerging, which we are not used to yet, as we are not used to our dead, inert and, wet and without any dangerous surprises. You have to leave the dead for the living, Isolde. Bury all of your dead. Think, remember, forget. May your memory forget its memories. May your oblivion remember what it has forgotten. Make sure not to die before your death. How to lend some grandeur to this present beast that only bends its weary knees at these late hours when the moon comes flying and places itself in the foreground. And yet we live waiting for a chance, for the formation of a sidereal sign in that allegorical beyond where even the sound of our bells does not reach. So we are waiting for that big chance that the North Pole tips like a hat in greeting, that the long awaited continent emerges while we sit here behind the bars of the horizon, that the murderer dashes by firing random rounds at his pursuers that it is known why that girl was born and not the boy promised by dreams and proclaimed so many times before. That we see that yawning cadaver stretching underground. That we see the glorious ghost among the tree-line avenues of heaven. That suddenly all the rivers stop at the shout of a command. That the heavens change places. That the seas pile up into a great pyramid taller than all Babel's dreamt of by ambition, that a desperate wind blows and extinguishes the stars, 
that a luminous finger writes a word in the night sky, that the house over there collapses. For this we live, trust me, and for this we live and not for anything else. For this we have a voice, and for this we have our voices wed. And for this we have this anguish coursing in our veins and a wounded animal galloping in our chest. For this flesh reddens, martyred by language, and thought swells, fed by subterranean streams. For this, the howl of fright inherited from the most tragic grandfather. Behead the monster that roars at the doorsteps of dreams, and then let no one forbid anything. Someone speaks and a blue lotus springs up at the pinnacle of the voice before the opium of the future gaze can shine. Peace on earth to the nocturnal sailor. The silent explorers raise their heads and the adventure takes off its golden suit. That is the meaning of sunset. Perhaps the sunset trusts us and then you would have understood the signs of the night. You would have understood the inventions of silence, the gaze of the night, the threshold of the abyss, the pilgrimage of the mountains, the night's crossing, Isolde, Isolde, I am my destiny. Where have you hidden the oasis you had repeatedly promised me? The light grew tired of walking. Where, tell me, does this ladder take me, the one that springs from your eyes and gets lost in the air? Don't you know that my destiny is to voyage? Don't you understand the explorer's vanity and the ghost of adventure? It is a matter of blood and bone within the field of a special magnet. It is the irrevocable destiny of a fabulous meteor. It is not a matter of love in the flesh. It is a matter of life, a matter of a roving spirit, of a nomadic bird. Thank you, Matthias, for that um, wonderful interview. And uh, Michael, um, I really love your voice and poetry. Um, so it's a gift to be here. And welcome, everyone. Here's the French. Combien de choses sont morts en nous? Combien de morts nous portons en nous? À quoi bon nous agripper à nos morts? Pourquoi nous obstinons-nous à ressusciter nos morts et nous empêche de voir l'idée qui naît? Nous avons peur de la nouvelle lumière qui se présente, à laquelle nous ne sommes pas encore habitués comme à nos morts immobiles et sans surprise dangereuse. Il faut abandonner ce qui est mort pour ce qui est vivant et seul. En terre, tout est mort. Pense, souviens, toi, oublie. Que ton souvenir oublie ses souvenirs. Que ton oubli se souvienne de ses oublis. Prends garde de ne pas mourir avant ta mort. Comment donner un peu de grandeur à cette bête actuelle qui seulement plie ses genoux de fatigue à ses hauteurs quand la lune arrive en volant à cette place en face Et pourtant, nous vivons en attendant au hasard la formation d'un signe cédéral dans cette allégorique. Au-delà, on n'arrive même pas le son de nos cloches. Ainsi attend le grand hasard que le pôle nord se détache comme le chapeau qui salue, que surgisse le continent que nous attendons depuis tant d'années, assis derrière les grilles de l'horizon, que l'assassin passe en courant et tirant sans contrôle sur ses poursuivants, que l'on sache pourquoi est né cette fille et non, le, et non le garçon promis par les rêves et annoncé tant de fois, que l'on voit le cadavre qui baille et s'étire sous la terre, que l'on voit passe le fantôme glorieux dans les allées du ciel, que tout d'un coup s'arrête toutes les rivières à une voie de commandement, Que le ciel sens de place, que les mers semblent en celle dans une grande pyramide plus haute que toutes les tours rêvées par l'ambition. 
que souffle un vent désespéré qui éteigne les étoiles. Qu'un doigt lumineux écrive un mot dans le ciel de la nuit que circule la maison d'en face. Pour cela, nous vivons, tu peux me croire, c'est pourquoi c'est là que nous vivons et non pour autre chose. Pour cela, nous avons une voix et pour cela, nous avons un filet dans la voix. Pour cela, nous avons ce courir angoissé dans les veines, ce galop l'animal blessé dans la poitrine. Pour cela, rougit la serre matricée des mots et pousse les pensées arrosées par les rivières souterraines. Pour cela, le hurlement du sursaut a été de l'ail le plus tragique. Couper la tête au monstre qui résume à la porte du rêve et après que personne n'interdise rien. Quelqu'un parle et il pousse son effunard au sommet de sa voix avant, qu avant que brille l'opium du regard futur peint sur la terre au matelot de la nuit. Les exploiteurs silencieux lèvent la tête et l'aventure se dépouille à de ses vêtements. Voici le chance du cochon. Peut-être le cochon voudra nous écouter, alors vous prenez les signes de la nuit. Vous comprendrez les invitations du silence, le rêve du rêve, le regard du rêve, le seuil de l'abîme, le voyage des montagnes, la traversée de la nuit. Et seul, et seul, je suis mon destin. Où as-tu cassé l'oasis que tu m'avais promis tant de fois La lumière s'est fatiguée de marcher. Où conduit, dis-moi cet escalier qui sort de tes yeux et se perd dans l'air. C'est que, sais-tu que mon dessein est de marcher, connais-tu la vanité de l'exploiteur et le fantôme de l'aventure C'est une question de sang et d'os devant un aimant spécial. C'est un destin irrévocable des matériaux fabuleux. Ce n'est pas une question d'amour en chair, c'est une question de vie. Une question d'esprit voyageur, d'oiseau nomade. Thank you, Baba. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the Spanish uh, section. Cuántas cosas han muerto adentro de nosotros. Cuánta muerte llevamos en nosotros. Por qué aferrarnos a nuestros muertos. Por qué nos empeñamos en resucitar nuestros muertos. Ellos nos impiden ver la idea que nace. Tenemos miedo a la nueva luz que se presenta, a la que no estamos habituados todavía, como a nuestros muertos inmóviles y sin sorpresa peligrosa. Hay que dejarlo muerto por lo que vive. Y solda, entierra a todos tus muertos. Piensa, recuerda, olvida. Que tu recuerdo olvide sus recuerdos. Que tu olvido recuerde sus olvidos. Cuida de no morir antes de tu muerte. ¿Cómo dar un poco de grandeza a esta bestia actual que solo dobla sus rodillas de cansancio a esas altas horas en que la luna llega volando y se coloca al frente? Y sin embargo, vivimos esperando un azar, la formación de un signo sideral en ese expiatorio más allá en donde no alcanza a llegar ni el sonido de nuestras campanas. Así, esperando el gran azar, que el polo norte se desprenda como el sombrero que saluda, que surja el continente que estamos aguardando desde hace tantos años, aquí, sentados, detrás de las rejas del horizonte, que pase corriendo el asesino disparando balazos sin control a sus perseguidores, que se sepa por qué nació aquella niña y no el niño prometido por los sueños y anunciado tantas veces, que se vea el cadáver que bosteza y se estira debajo de la tierra, que se vea pasar el fantasma glorioso entre las arboledas del cielo, que de repente se detengan todos los ríos a una voz de mando, que el cielo cambie de lugar, que los mares se amontonen en una gran pirámide más alta que todas las pabeles soñadas por la ambición, que sople un viento desesperado y apague las estrellas, que un dedo luminoso escriba una palabra en el cielo de la noche, que se derrumbe la casa de enfrente. 
Para esto vivimos, puedes creerme, para esto vivimos y no para otra cosa. Para esto tenemos voz y para esto tenemos una red en la voz. Y para esto tenemos ese correr angustiado adentro de las venas y ese galope de animal herido en el pecho. Para esto enrojece la carne martirizada de las palabras y crece el pensamiento regado por los ríos subterráneos. Para esto el aullido del sobresalto heredado del abuelo más trágico. Cortado la cabeza al monstruo que ruge en la puerta del sueño y luego que nadie prueba nada. Alguien habla y hace una amapola, nace una amapola en la cumbre de la voz antes de que brille el opio de la mirada futura. Paz en la tierra al marinero de la noche. Los exploradores silenciosos levantan la cabeza y la aventura se desnuda de su traje de oro. He aquí el sentido del ocaso. ¿Acaso el ocaso nos haga caso? Y entonces habréis comprendido los signos de la noche. Habréis comprendido los inventos del silencio, la mirada del sueño, el umbral del abismo, el viaje de los montes, la travesía de la noche. Y solda, y solda, yo sigo mi destino. ¿En dónde has escondido el oasis que me habías prometido tantas veces? La luz se cansó de andar. ¿A dónde lleva, dime, esa escalera que sale de tus ojos y se pierde en el aire? ¿Sabes tú que mi destino es andar? ¿Conoces la vanidad del explorador y el fantasma de la aventura? Es una cuestión de sangre y huesos frente a un imán especial. Es un destino irrevocable de meteoro fabuloso. No es una cuestión de amor en carne. Es una cuestión de vida, una cuestión de espíritu viajante, de pájaro nómada. Michael, Baba, Ignacio, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, it was like seeing, you know, the the poem refracted in three different languages, but also like three different readers too. And you know, you each sort of shed new light uh, in different angle on, on the whole thing. It, it was great. Um, uh, I want to also thank everyone for tuning in and listening. Um, I had a, a college professor ages ago who said that. Poetry, you can kind of think of poetry as a conversation you're allowed to eavesdrop on. And uh, this is really amenable to the webinar format that we're doing tonight. Uh, so I hope that our conversation rises to the level of poetry that you can eavesdrop on. Um, so anyway, uh, my, my first sort of question comes out of a confession, which is, I had never heard of uh, Widow Girl before <laughs> I read this book. And um, he's been, you know, quite a discovery and there's, you know, so much richness there that I, I have lacked in my life before now. And so I'm curious, and I, and I want to start with Ignacio, if he could give us just some sort of contextual background for who Rodovro was as a, as a person in history, um, who he is in his own literary context, and um, just sort of, you know, the poem as well, what, what sort of milieu it arises from. So Derek, absolutely. Uh, you know, I feel like, um, you know, Widover falls into the, you know, who is Ezra Pound uh, category, who is Apollinaire, <laughs> who is Neruda. Uh, he's really, uh, a really important um, uh, writer within uh, the Chilean uh, tradition, the Latin American tradition, and really within world poetry as well. So I feel, you know, part of the, the problem with the for, for different reasons, and, and these are, some of them are more complicated than others. Um, uh, Widover's work hasn't received the kind of attention within the Anglophone world uh, that, that it should, but also within the Francophone World, even though Widover wrote most of his poetry in French uh, himself, so in, in both in French and Spanish, so it's um, it's a it's a super influential figure. I would say that two main categories to understand Widover. The first one is would be he's very influential in the development of of modern Latin American poetry, modern Spanish language poetry. Uh, uh, I, his work is really 
connected also within the the, the development of the the historical avant-garde. So that would be the other category. He's a really avant-garde poet, uh, very committed to his own poetic vision more than anything. I feel in terms of even more than his life, more it's his commitment to his his poetry in a very avant-garde uh, mode is is really central to 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 his his influence. Uh, he really played a role uh, connecting uh, Latin American poetry with with world poetry in in, in really fascinating ways that I, I feel still needs to be uh, explored. Uh, very controversial figure as well in terms of a lot of different things. Uh, uh, but he, I think the, the you know he's he's has been read as a Cubist uh, poet as a you know he developed his own uh, avant-garde poetics uh, of, the, the, he called them creacionismo and in terms of you know his his uh, importance now I feel you know he's really influential in the what we can call uh, you know mid to late 20th century poetry in Latin America in particular. Uh, I feel like one of the cool things of, of this book, which I also I have it here, uh, which we, we, I love the cover. It's an amazing book. <laughs> yeah. I came out with uh, Coin Press, which is, uh, I really wanted to, to give a shout out to, to Coin Press and to Steve Halley for believing in the project. And part of the reason why I'm bringing this up is um, Coin Press has published some of the really, really influential Latin American poets of the, of the mid to, to contemporary tw uh, 20th century to the contemporary moment. Writers like uh, Juan Gelman, Miguel Angel Bustos, uh, Raul Zurita, Victor Rodriguez Nunez. Uh, then other poets are really influenced by his work, uh, Cristina Pérez Rossi, uh, Cecilia Vecuña, Alejandra Pizzo. So there's a, there's a whole world of, of poetry that owes some uh, connections to, to, to this work and to Idobra's work. Um, yeah, I'll keep it here. I don't know if Michael wants to add anything. Yeah, well, go ahead, Michael, if you've got something to add. I... Well, I think, uh, you know, I just want to um, emphasize how, I guess, central Widobro is in, in the DNA uh, of, of the Chilean tradition. I mean, it's such a contrast to how um, kind of obscure he is in an Anglophone context. You know, for example, the last time I was uh, in Chile, um, one of my Chilean friends had uh, put together an asado, a, a barbecue uh, before I left. And um, he invited all these literary types. And, um, you know, I met a translator um, and, you know, I started to explain that I was involved in uh, translating Temblor. And he, you know, he just started reciting, you know, the opening pages to me. And it, that's, you know, wow. it's like it, it encoded into, it, you know, the, the consciousness of, of Chilean poetics. Um, but in contrast, um, there was this, um, uh, kind of incisive review that that Kent Johnson made in the Chicago Review when he was um, he was reviewing the the, the the latest Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics came out in 2012 and uh, he particularly called out the the entry on avant garde avant garde poetry that um, Marjorie Perloff wrote and you know he says how can you uh, not even mention uh, several figures, but Will Obro was one of them. So um, we really hope that our translation is going to rectify this and really start to put them on the map in, uh, in, the po in poetry and literary communities um, in, in the US. Well, yeah, so I, I want to follow up on that uh, idea um, because one of the, the great things about translation is that it gives new life, you know, the, the famous afterlives uh, of a poet. So, so, so Widobro has this chance to have a new life in English in your work. Um, and consequently, he is, you know, ideally, hopefully, <laughs> will have uh, some sort of similar impact on Anglophone poetics, right? And so I'm curious what you think he brings to, you know, a century later to 2020, in terms of his poetic vision, and in terms of how um, American poets or Anglophone poets in general, but also just people who like poetry, scholars, students can, how can they engage with him? And what will, what will they find in Skyquake that they may not have encountered elsewhere? Yeah, um, so, you know, my sense is that for, you know, the past few decades, there's been a, a kind of um, 
renaissance in, in long form poetry. Um, you know, I see, you know, I teach in an MFA program, my students like, you know, they like to go long. And, um, you know, this is just a, a great example of, you know, someone who can somehow maintain this sense of poetic intensity for uh, a pretty sizable stretch. So um, certainly for, you know, fans of the long poem, uh, it's a prose poem, which, you know, even as late as, you know, kind of late into the 20th century in mainstream U.S. poetics, prose poetry was sort of seen as this bizarre kind of outlier type thing. Um, so for fans of prose poetry, um, you know, this is a great um, kind of early 20th century example. Um, and um, it's, it's, you know, it's funny just to think about just the animating impulse of, of Skyquake, which is this kind of erotic, uh, apocalyptic vision and um, just the, you know, conjuring all these images of kind of global indie cosmic uh, cataclysm and catastrophe. So, you know, certainly, you know, in, in you know, this uh, era of, of, of global pandemic, you know, there, there are certain resonances and, um, and we didn't plan this, but I was looking over, you know, the section that we're gonna uh, read soon, but there's this image of lovers, we can say sheltering in place um, in catacombs uh, un until eternity, which I thought you know was was quite fitting. Though you know we we were working on this um, translation for for many many years, you know, way before um, this current moment. But it's kind of interesting to see um, the contemporary resonances uh, you know one can pick up uh, when when reading this text. Oh, that yeah, I, the the long poem thing really speaks to me. Um, because I'm probably going to be working on that for my own dissertation, um, and and that was you know one of the big appeals to this book to me was that you know the dearth of international long poetry in, in English is is definitely a, a, a contemporary issue. One of the drawbacks to long poems is that um, it's difficult to say like oh this is the poem I really like in that work. Um, but one of the great things about them is if I asked you to do that, you could pick maybe a line or two. Um, that would like, because it seems to me that Widobro has been in your orbit or in your background for a while, right? You know, he's been in your consciousness, but I'm curious if there was a, a line or a moment where you said, oh, I have to translate him. I have to do more with Skyquake than, than merely be a reader of it or an appreciator of it. I have to get in there and deal with it. And so I, I don't know if either one of you have strong feelings about that, or if even the things that you're planning on reading in a minute, maybe Ignacio. Yeah, yeah I mean, I was just gonna say the the title. I mean, I feel the title of the work, Skyquake, Temblor de Cielo, uh, Tremblement de Ciel in, in French, mm -hmm. is really, it feels like it's a translational space. Mm -hmm. It's in between languages, it's between French and Spanish, it's in between uh, heaven and the earth, uh, it's, it's really that space in between the very um, uh, liminal realm of language as well. And I feel like that's why we, 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 we called it Skyquake Colon Tremor of Heaven because we, we really didn't wanna choose one versus the other. We wanted to create that balance mm -hmm. in the, in, in, from the beginning in, in how we were conceiving with the, with the work, this, this sense of this movement across language, um, across energy, uh, yeah. that, that is represented by by the title, and I feel uh, you know another thing to to add to the conversation would be that I really think that with Dobro, uh, there's a whole field of translational poetics that mm -hmm. is evolving throughout the last 20, 30 years, um, not only in English with you know Christian Hockey's ventricle or even our own uh, Mary Jo Bang. So and also a, a shout out to to Mary Jo uh, in terms of translation, but I think also in Spanish with uh, Helman, Juan Helman, and also Pizarnik that are really experimented with, with languages across. So that's, that, that, I would say that. Yeah, um, I really am enjoying this conversation, but we don't want to just talk. Um, how about the second reading now? Is that a good time? Sounds like a great time. I'll, I'll take it from, from here. Ese es tu destino. Deja cada cual su libertad, que está al principio o al final del vuelo, como una rama o un puerto. Y ahora calla. 
el moribundo aprieta los labios para que no huya el pájaro definitivo a cantar su romanza sobre otras rocas. Todo obedece a la cadencia de una voz que nadie sabe de dónde cae. He ahí el destino de la mariposa magnética. He ahí el esqueleto aguardando pacientemente su hora, escondido en las sombras. El esqueleto final que jugará al ajedrez bajo su casa de tierra mientras viven sus sombreros en las calles ajenas. Y podéis llorar porque semejante es el horóscopo del árbol. Esconder las caricias en las cavernas de los pájaros polares, en donde el hombre se clava estalactitas en los ojos y la mujer corre saltando entre los icebergs. Y solda, ya viene el huracán asolando el cementerio de las miradas. Ya viene el huracán con la velocidad de los planetas lanzados al destino. Escondámonos en las más hondas catacumbas y allí grabemos nuestro nombre en las piedras sensibles junto al nicho en donde debemos acostarnos por la eternidad. Allí los curiosos de mañana encontrarán nuestras calaveras y nuestros huesos mezclados. Sangra la frente del tiempo en la oscuridad sin reposo de la noche. Sangra destrozada por montañas de espinas. ¿Qué importa? En la terraza de la última cima, mi garganta estuvo tragándose todos los truenos del cielo y mis dedos acariciaron el lomo de los relámpagos, mientras el sol, detrás de la noche, rehacía sus huestes y se preparaba para el ataque del día siguiente. ¿Oyes el ruido de las olas que se estrellan a causa de la oscuridad? No temas, vámonos. Es el velero de la muerte. El monstruo amado se acerca y viene a lamer nuestras manos. La tierra es dulce y blanda como el colchón de la eternidad. That is your destiny. Let everyone have their freedom that lies at the beginning or the end of the flight like a branch or a harbor, and now remain silent. The dying man purses his lips so that the definitive bird cannot escape and sing its romanza to other rocks. Everything obeys the cadence of a voice that just fell from the sky. No one knows where it came from. Here's the destiny of a magnetic butterfly. Here is the skeleton patiently waiting for its hour, ensconced in shadow, the final skeleton that will play chess under its earthen house while its hats dwell in distant streets. And you could weep because such is the horoscope of the tree. Hide the caresses of polar birds in the caverns where a man is nailing stalactites into his eyes and a woman leaps among the icebergs. Isolde, Here comes the hurricane ravaging the graveyard of gazes. Here comes the hurricane with the speed of planets flung to fate. Let's hide in the deepest catacombs where we'll etch our names on the sensitive stones next to the alcove in which we must rest for eternity. There the curious ones of tomorrow will discover the intermingling of our skulls and our bones. The forehead of time bleeds in the dark without the respite of night. It bleeds, torn apart by mountains of thorns. What does it matter? On the terrace of the final summit, my throat once swallowed all the thunder in the sky, and my fingers caressed the backs of lightning bolts, while the sun behind the night reassembled the remains of its troops and prepared for the siege of the following day. Do you hear the noise of the waves crashing on account of the darkness? Don't be afraid. Let's go. It's the sailboat of death. The beloved monster approaches to lick our hands. The earth is sweet and soft like the mattress of eternity. Yeah, one of the things I really love about this poem is the way that it like sets up these sort of oppositions, but then immediately subverts them and slips away from them. And, and I partly bring this up because I really think the, 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 the basic physical shape of your book does the same thing. Um, so one of the things that I, I, I'm, I'm gonna explain a little bit to the people who are listening in. So, you know, the book is on one hand, you know, Skyquake translation, 
And then on the other side, you flip it over, it's the Spanish and French. Um, you know, we've seen this this in other books. Like, I, doesn't Ventracle do something similar? I think. Um, but what? But my favorite part of the book is that the translator's note is not at the beginning. It's not at the, not at the end. It's not a preface. It's not a postscript. It's a subscript, and it happens right in the middle. It happens in the center of the book. It, it's I'm trying to find it here. It, it's this weird moment where it's simultaneously like the central thing, but it's also like displaced at the same time. It's great. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the translator's note, it's not just a translator's note, it's five translator's notes. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's not like one for the French, one for the Spanish, one for the English. It's not, you know, it, it, it like the numbers just are just offset just a little bit. It's great. And so I'm curious for to um, I, I want to ask you, Michael, for like your thoughts on how you came to this organization of the book, and you know maybe what's going on with those translators' notes that seem to be simultaneously by one of you or the other of you or neither of you or both of you or this great blurring going on. Yeah, that's that's a a, a great question, Derek. Um, I mean, we, we wanted it to be precisely located in, in what Ignacy was calling a kind of liminal space. It's kind of paratextual, so beside, but yet paradoxically in in the, in the center. Um, and we we didn't want to start with um, any framing just because we we believe that the poem um, it, it's, it's very autonomous. I think we really wanted to to kind of feature the poetry uh, up front just because it can. You know, we believe it can speak across time and, and across space. Um, one cool thing about the translator's notes is that it allowed us to inhabit our individual voices and we kind of trade it off and uh, we won't tell you who wrote who, what, you, you guys will have to figure it out. Um, and it's just to give a, a sense of balance since um, in the translation, it, it, we really, it, it, it was a true collaboration. I mean, we just had um, just so many back and forths. I was just kind of scrolling through all of the emails that, that we had over the years. And um, we, we really merged together our kind of translators' voices. So we wanted to kind of separate them out a bit and but stagger them and uh, be able to get at Wheelbarrow from uh, various perspectives, you know, I mean, just to give a sense of um, our, our various interpretations of, 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 of this very important figure in this, in this very important text. Yeah, so on that collaboration, um, I'm, I'm very curious about it as, you know, someone, a translator myself, who most of the time works alone. And so I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, if I can ask Ignacio, maybe the you know, the, the basic logistics of what that collaboration looked like. Like, how did you mutually decide to do this project? How did you meet to go about it? And not only because it's, you know, the, the practicalities of it, but also it's really interesting how this is a collaboration between two scholars and writers, but also between three languages, so to speak. Um, and so there's, there's more going on than simply, you know, an even exchange. There's a there's a circle of, of movement, um, and and so yeah, I'm curious what what that looked like, the process, and sort of what you got out of it as well. Um, so thank you, Derek. That, that's a great. I mean, I feel like that this is the, the 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 result of collaboration. I mean, basically everything that we did is is is, is based on a sure commitment to a particular kind of work, to a particular poetics, uh, it's a true collaborative um, uh, experience. You know, Michael and I are, have known each other for almost 20 years. So that's like, that, you know, we, we went to grad school together. So we've been friends for a long time. And I feel, you know, working through what we wanted to do, you know, this was more like a dream project that became a reality, uh, really. And, and, and together we, we the process itself was I feel in terms of the mechanics of, of how we did it. I don't know if you wanted to know a little bit about that, Derek. If that was something well, that you no, know, like was it a? I mean, I know this is getting really into wonky details, but like 
was it a Google Doc? Was it Skype conversations? Was it emails? Did you, you know, use carrier pigeons or, or, or whatever? Like, like because because I think something about the 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 you know the the form in which the collaboration takes, I would imagine, has some connection on what the results of the collaboration end up being. Um, yeah. So no, totally. So we, you know, we we exchange the way we I we work with a very very literal translation. Uh, that I produce as a sort of basic stuff. And then we really went back and forth, mostly uh, through Word documents and just keep uh, comments and going over comments and, and getting versions of sections and working through those versions and, and talking. We, so at some point, uh, we, we would talk over Skype or the phone or, you know, so they were, then we would meet in some conferences to, to yeah. present their work and then hang out and then, so. Yeah. It was a, a multi-dimensional uh, uh, kind of like uh, multimedia kind of space. What I, I'm just to pin down one more little thing because I'm really curious about the three languages. Uh, because one of the great things about this text is how it sort of displaces originality or the primacy of the original. You know, is it French? Is it Spanish? Um, and you go into some detail in your translator's note about which one was published published first, and and you know sort of the the fraught history of that. But I'm curious for you as translators, you know, did you consult one first and then revise with the other? Did you sort of look at them in parallel? Are there discrepancies between the the texts, or where you know this word maybe gives you this word in French makes you think of this other word in English that works better than you know the the word in Spanish might very literally be or something like that. I, I don't did, know. If, uh, maybe Michael can. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we we did look at the Spanish and, and French in parallel, and you know, my sense is the French that there is slightly more detail. It's it's extremely subtle, um, but um, it, it that it, it really, um, I think speaks to, I guess, the temporality of the process that Ignacio was explaining that, you know, so many back and forths, just looking at one thing and then the other thing, looking at the Spanish, looking at the French, you know, looking at what he was suggesting, looking at what I was suggesting. Um, and, you know, I, I you know, it, it took such a long time. And, you know, I'm sure if Ignacio did it by himself, it would, it would have taken, you know, four times as fast or if I were working by myself, you know, you know, we just, being able to make all decisions, you know, by yourself. Um, but, you know, there was something to the collaborative process, constantly shuttling back and forth between our different ideas, between the, the different languages that I, I thought was really productive, just forcing us to slow down and just to consider the musicality of the language, to consider um, diction, word choice, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we, we can't, um, convey the musicality of Spanish, but, you know, thinking about what are the resources of English that can try to make up for it and to make our language um, interesting and, and poetic. And, you know, all of that, you know, um, it just, it took a lot of time. Um, and, you know, as Ignacio was saying, this is, you know, this, this was a dream project for us. Um, we didn't have any professional pressures to, you know, produce. I mean, you know, I, you know, I had my own things going on with my criticism and my poetry writing. So it was, you know, it, it was, it, it felt like this autonomous space that we can really just, you know, we did it for the love. We did it for the love of, of Widobro, for the love of this poetry. Um, and I think, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, the, the slowness of, of the process. Yeah, yeah, Matthias. So maybe that uh, also runs true for Udobro himself, kind of like having those two versions, having this conversation with himself in two different literary systems and two, two different languages and two different also musical systems in a way. I have another question related to the translation issue. Um, Tristan and Isolde is such a preeminent myth in uh, European history. It's such a European legend. And especially in German literature, it resonated. Gottfried from Strasbourg wrote a really powerful, uh, monumental verse uh, novel uh, around Tristan and Isolde. Richard Wagner composed uh, one of his most uh, exciting operas around that myth. And Thomas Mann wrote uh, one of his best uh, short uh, pieces uh, on Tristan and Isolde. What was so attractive to Uidobro? 
Because I, I think so. The Wagner was an influence. Very, uh, I, I actually, he was really influenced by the Wagner uh, uh, opera, and um, I think it's really this whole idea. Not only like you know the recuperation of medieval, um, you know, legends and stuff that is a part of modernism to to a large degree, but also this this whole idea of of thinking of love as a potion. This idea that love can heal you and can also damage you. It's like a really powerful kind of drug that can do many different things. And what he does is to kind of take this idea and, and take it to like a planetary cosmic level. Uh, and, 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 you know, that opens up a series of, you know, realms within the poem that, that are flowing and moving from one place to another. And, and really, so I think, I, I really think that that is something about that, that, that we Dobro was interested. And also it's about the experience of trouble, of, of moving. Uh, and one thing that, that, that is important to stress out is the way in which this, uh, this, this work is a, almost like a second part to a Dobro's uh, masterpiece, which is Altasor. Uh, and there's that notion of, 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 of moving, of experience, of transcending language, transcending space that is also connected to, to Tristan and Isolde in this way. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting things to me about the Tristan and Isolde sections in the, in, the, in the poem is that I am sort of vaguely familiar with the myth. Um, and definitely if I were more informed, I would probably get more of, out of the poem, you know, if I did my own research. But at the same time, the characters, you know, the way he's written it, the characters stand on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the dynamics between them are fairly clear. He's really, he's not relying entirely on an outside understanding for, for the poem to work. Um, yeah, Matthias? I mean, Michael and, and Ignacio, uh, since uh, your translator's note are really turning into essays and into, you know, nuclei for, for books to be written about. And uh, there's so much going on in Uidobro's life uh, himself. He is such a transnational figure and also such a transgressional figure in sense of uh, being inspired by the avant-garde, being the avant-garde, being involved with Tristran Zara, you know, having works with uh, Pierre Riverdi, one of the greatest French uh, writers of uh, his times, uh, having quarrels with Pablo Neruda, who kind of like attacked him of wanting to be the Superman, wanting to do everything. And he did everything, right? I mean, he became a Zulu politician, you know, uh, created new f movements every now and then, uh, wrote a novel, which kind of like one, he wanted to turn this into a uh, a movie, uh, won a prize for that, went to New York, hung out with Douglas Fairbanks and uh, who was at, uh, you know, lots, lots of those uh, movie stars in the 1920s. And so he seems to be like a little bit crazy. Uh, in this, uh, how is that related to the to the work itself? Yeah, I mean, there is this sort of manic energy. This is this Ergebnis meiner Websuche. Uh, bursting through every line. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny when Ignacio started to, to talk at the beginning of our session, he mentioned, you know, Pound. And there's that, of course, the famous uh, Hugh Kenner book, The Pound Era. And it's, well, you know, we there's a claim to be, you know, said, you know, to, to, to talk about a Widobra era. I mean, he was, you know, he was just all over the place, did everything um, and just so prolific. I mean, it's just really, um, just stunning what he was able to do. And just, you know, this is, you know, um, you know, as far as, you know, book length poems go, it's not super long, but it just, it seems so dense to me. Like, it's like, um, you know, like, like he, he took three books of the same length and kind of squashed them into, into one, one book. And you just feel that, I don't know, that, that dense intensity um, at, at, at every moment. So, um, you know, just to kind of circle back to, you know, Derek, you had asked the question about like, what, what was it about, you know, was there a particular passage in, 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 in this book that, you know, made us want to translate it? And it seems like, well, it's, you know, it, from the first word <laughs> to the last word. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like you, you, you step onto the roller coaster and then you just, you know, the ride just really starts to deepen and um, get crazy and get wild. And it's, it was just, um, you know, just really amazing for us to uh, kind of be along on, on the ride with him. Yeah, I mean, um, you 
you said he crammed three books into one, and that's exactly what you two have done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've taken three books and put them into one and um you know as, as Matias said it was it's this you know collaboration between languages and I can't imagine any other sort of translation that wasn't a, a collaboration of, of the type that the two of you have done um I think on that note it's about time to wrap it up I think you have a very collaborative uh reading to send us off with if I remember correctly that's right. And, and thank you, Derek. Thanks, Matthias. And, and, and thank you guys for listening. Enter, you all, into your own vertiginous cavern. Descend without chloroform into your intimate depths. Blood has its own light, and bones throw off sparks because of a feverous phosphorus like an electric charge. Ladies and gentlemen, Hay un muerto que aplasta sus cabellos bajo la cabeza, adentro de su ataúd. Vosotros tenéis hermosos dientes para decir hermosas palabras. Señoras y señores. There is a bird that opens up in mid-flight to fling eternity down at us. Nos arroja entre sangre y vísceras la eternidad como una inmunda promesa. The bird divine by inexorable astronomers knows all the secrets. Ladies and gentlemen. Hay un muerto que está deviniendo esqueleto en su ataúd. Emanations from the flesh split the wood and make the stone door swing. Y cuando los huesos, señoras y señores, rompan los lazos que los atan entre sí, como las constelaciones, harán un ruido fabuloso, un ruido de catástrofe para los oídos afinados, más violento que aquel de las lejanías que se libertan y se alejan al galope. Tal es el ansia del prisionero evadido que hace aullar los caminos y que asusta al tiempo sin entrañas, al tiempo que hace gestos de universo. Señoras y señores. The serpent of shipwrecks bites its tail and enlarges. It expands until infinity. We are inside its circles, sucked into the abyss of the future of putrefaction, pus oozing from our eyes like spume from the sea. En tanto, los paisajes internos sienten el vuelo de los árboles. Nuestros oídos, antes de despegarse y caer como hojas, alcanzan a oír el torbellino de las espigas que se ahondan. No hay esperanza de reposo. En vano, el esqueleto detrás de su vidrio toma la actitud hierática del que va a cantar. The inner doors of the planet cover their ears with violence, like the nurse who hears the battle cries of the terrible mission at the final frontier. Nada se gana con pensar que acaso, detrás de la muralla abstracta, se extiende la zona voluptuosa del asombro. No, you will not find the old man sitting on the rocks of the eternal snowstorm, smiling softly and surrounded by meditative heroes like palm trees. Two more words, my friends, before the end. In vain are our struggles and our disputes. In vain it is, is the phosphorescence of our swords and our words. Only the coffin is right. Victory belongs to the cemetery. Triumph only flourishes in the field sown with mystery. That was the speech that you have called macabre for no reason, the beautiful speech of the announcer of nothingness. Go ahead. Follow your path as I follow mine. I am too slow in dying. Nevertheless, it's old. Prepare your tears. Distantly forgiving like a piano of remorse. Prepare your best tears. I am slow in dying. The statue walks along the sea and the wind closes my eyelids. It's a sign of permeating glory. Michael, Ignacio, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, Matthias, do you have a couple of final announcements? Actually, when glory is the last word, it has to be the last word. But as all times in the cinema now, so you have end credits, which leads you to a reading after the reading. So let me invite you to our closing event this semester. Uh, we will have as a guest in the International Writer Series, Katya Parrott. Um, who will present her first novel, The Masochist, translated from the Slovenian. 
by Michael Biggins in a virtual reading and discussion with Lynn Tadlock, chair of the program in comparative literature. It is really a funny novel about um, Nadeshta Moza, the daughter of Leopold von Sacha Masoch, and it will kind of like shed a light on the luminaries of the Austrian Hungarian Empire's cultural elite. It's really hilarious. So please turn in uh, to the International Writers Series on December 9th, uh, same time, same procedure. Thank you so much, Derek, for walking us through this wonderful book. Michael and uh, Ignacio for translating this and uh, really being such gracious uh, uh, people to kind of like share all your insights with us today. Please, everybody, uh, buy this book, read this book, and join us for the after party now. Walter has sent us uh, the link in the chat function. Thank you, Baba, for reading the French, and you will read some more very, very soon in this series. Thank you all. And that is bye bye. Have a good night, y'all.